We'll now call the plan commission meeting of March 26, 2024 to order. Uh, roll call, please. Hannah here. Grillo here. Sullivan here. Lorik here. Gavich here. Kuzikowski here. Oldani here. Here. Chandler here. Uh, we'll get us to approval of the minutes of February 27th, 2024. Everybody take a moment, see that they're correctly in order. And if you're satisfied, there's no errors, omissions, corrections, or discussion. Motion. Or seconds. Uh, roll call, beginning with Christine. Anna, aye. Rillo abstains. Sullivan abstains. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Kuzikowski, aye. Oldani abstains. Chandler, aye. Um, that will get us to item four, um, review and discuss a report on recent common council actions. Gary? Council approved the following. A resolution approving a lot line adjustment or certified survey map submitted by Ashley Pollux of Thrive Architects for the properties at 321 and 401 West Marquette Avenue and appointed Christy Porter as Community Development Director. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Gary. Um, Item five, review and discuss recent Board of Housing and Zoning Appeal actions. Mary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the Board of Housing and Zoning Appeals met on March 4th. They heard two cases at their meeting. The first was a request by Joshua Chekai from 8500 South Sharon Drive. Long story short on this one, it was a contractor error where a Front addition was built on without the knowledge of the landowners, nor was it permitted. As soon as the landowner was made aware of this situation, they did contact the city and applied for an, um, a variance to allow for that front addition to remain. It would be four feet into the required 25 foot setback. They received many letters of support from their surrounding neighbors and the Board of Appeals agreed and granted the variance. They also heard a case from James Lawrence at 9080 South Shepherd Avenue. This was a request for a front yard fence, and for many unique circumstances, the board felt that the landowner had the opportunity to put the fence in the front yard due to the fact that they could not put that in the backyard for several reasons. So they did grant the variance and allowed for a six foot tall fence with, uh, in the, within the front or street facing yard. And they also required that there be landscaping installed per code for street facing uh, fences as required. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, item six is our quarterly parks recreation commission actions. Uh, that report will be coming this April 23rd, 2024. It will lead us to item 7A as a public hearing for a sign appeal uh, submitted by William Gus, Milwaukee Yard. It would allow the applicant to install one 18-foot monument sign on the property at 7727 South Longwater Drive. Melanie. The City of Oak Creek notice of public hearing before the Plan Commission. Important notice, a public hearing for a sign appeal will be held on March 26, 2024 at 6 p.m. at the Common Council Chambers. The appellant is William Gust, Milwaukee Yard. Tax key number is 7849034000. Property location is 7727 South Longwater Drive. To request a variance from section 170604 sub C 2B, which states the maximum permitted height of multi-tenant monument signs in the B4, B6, LM1, M1 and I1 district shall not exceed 16 feet. If granted, the variance would allow the appellant to install one multi-tenant monument sign with the height of 18 feet on the property at 7727 South Longwater Drive. Zoning of the property is B4 General Business PUD. All interested persons wishing to be heard are invited to be present. Dated this 6th day of March, 2024. Plan Commission, City of Oak Creek, Wisconsin, Mayor Dan Bukiewicz, Chairman. 
Okay, thank you. As this is pub, uh, it is a public hearing, and we will be making three calls. Um, do we want to do a narrative beforehand on the poll? The maximum allowed height is 16 feet for, for multi-tenant monument signs. They are really only looking for an additional two feet. I believe the narrative provided by the appellant was due to the slope kind of of the ground near where the sign will be. They're asking to kind of, not sure the right word for that one, make up for it? Yeah. Um, close enough. Yeah, close enough. As pictured, the sign location will be closer to the end of the property line, which is located right by I-94. On the right, you will see the, di the graphics provided. Okay, on the screen is variance considerations for the plan commission. Okay. Um, as this is a public hearing, I will make three calls. If you do wish to speak on it, please approach the podium. We'll need your name and address for the official minutes. So, this will be the first call. Anybody wishing to speak? Second call. Anybody wishing to speak? Please approach the podium. Third and final call. Okay, we will now close the public hearing on item 7A, and we will go on to 8A, which is consideration of a request for that sign appeal uh, submitted by William Gus, Milwaukee Yard. It would allow the applicant to install the 18-foot monument sign on the property at 7727 South Longwater Drive. Um, would the applicant like to say a few words or just wait on any possible questions? I'll take that as a wait. Okay, uh, we'll start off uh, to my left, Christine. I have no question, thank you. All right, Dawn. I have a couple questions for the applicant. Um, uh, name and address, folks. And you can pull that microphone. Uh, Kimberly Froelich, uh, 7727 Longwater Drive, the property that we're in question of the sign. Um, I get a, uh, the image that is um, provided for us. Is that going to be a moving image? Is that going to be video? Uh, the top image. Yeah, I can handle that. <laughs> Scott Basie, I'm with Bauer Sign and Lighting. My address is 17414. I can hear you. Very good. Scott Basie, Bauer Sign. This is 17414 West Cleveland Avenue, New Berwyn, Wisconsin. The upper is an EMC. It's not going to be moving graphics, but it certainly will be something that can display what's taking place within the building itself. And do you know if the plan is to change it periodically? Change periodically. That would be correct. It might show basketball courts. It may, may show parties going on. It may say, say different things. It's not a video, but the images wouldn't rotate, they would just change periodically. Periodically, correct. Okay. And then um, another question, it looks like uh, you have space for four tenants. Do you have other tenants in that facility? Not at this time. But the idea would be that you would. Correct. Okay. All right, thank you, Don. Uh, Matt? I have no concerns or comments. Uh, Greg? <clears throat> um, I think it's an appropriate height I think the narrative that the applicant provided kind of explains it well enough. My only question would be, um, you do reference that there's no neighboring residential. Um, do you know, are both sides gonna be lit up or is it just the one side? As far as this monument sign is concerned, both sides. Okay. Do you know where it's placed if your building juts out enough to kind of block it from the multifamily Development that's just north going of it. to the north of the building, that would not be blocked in a block. So it'll be like 
like the light will go towards them? No, they won't okay. see it at all. Oh, okay. That's they, my question. No. The way it is right now facing on the west side of the property, people in that residence on the north will not have any okay. visual of that unless they're walking out towards the green light. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Chris? I have no questions. Don? No questions. Fred? Thank you. Is this sign illuminated 24-7? The message center up on top would be used 24-7 as far as the illumination of the tenant panels below. That could be changed and okay. timed, but certainly would probably be beneficial to keep it lit. Okay. Thank you. And Gossie? I do have a question in regards to its location. Uh, can you provide more information on why this particular location for this monument sign? Because sure. there's no traffic there, right? Nothing passing it besides the cars on the interstate. There's no what, I'm sorry? Traffic. Traffic. Uh, moving vehicles. Well, the traffic on, by the interstate, that's correct. But mm -hmm. the placement of this sign originally wanted to be on the southern part of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, where it would go was not in the boundaries of their property. If it was there, we could be at the 16 feet. It happens to be elevated on that side. That's ideal. Instead, we moved it to the southern part. We could move it along that way, but we were trying to eliminate having to go into the parking lot itself and tear up asphalt, taking away parking spacing. Also, where it's located there, it's easier to get access to power to that monument site. That was the reason for it. And because of the fencing that's there, we were trying to just bring it up high enough so it's not obstructing the tenant panels. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I'll just throw my two cents in. Uh, regarding the 18-foot height, I am fine with it. The topography leads it on a downward slope that way. I think the applicant made that pretty clear. It's really appropriate. Um, I actually travel that ramp frequently. Um, I don't believe there'll be any stray um, nuisance lighting uh, affecting Hub 13. It's so I'm not really worried much about that. I think it's a good public amenity given what the traffic is and you know, the location that they have for reason. So I think it's good use. Um, there's no further discussion. Um, motion, please. Oh, Sleeper. wait. Is there anything from fire? I think so. Wanted to ask Mike. Okay, go ahead. Steepert moves to approve the sign variance allowing the installation of one 18 foot tall monument sign on the property at 7727 South Longwater Drive. Lork seconds. Uh, roll call beginning with Don. Grillo aye. Sullivan aye. Lork aye. Kavich aye. Kuzikowski aye. Old Donnie aye. Seepert aye. Chandler, aye. Hannah, aye. Okay. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Um, item 8B, um, review a request for a temporary use permit submitted by Casey Ertle, CE Farms for a temporary garden center in the parking lot at 7501 South Howell Avenue. Mel, you got this one? Yes. Okay. So as mentioned, it'll be a garden center at the Classic Lanes. They're requesting approval for this temporary garden center to be from April 15th to July 15th. It should look familiar since this will be the 14th, or this will actually be the 15th year if this one is approved, but they've been doing this every year for 14 years. The only difference this year is they are asking for an additional sign. So previously it was the 32 square foot unattached sign and additionally, they're looking for another 12 square foot unattached sign. Pictured is a 2019 operations photo. Since it has not changed locations, it's still a valid photo to use. Classic Lanes has agreed to supply water and restrooms for the operation. On screen is a suggested motion 
All right. Pretty much. Uh, applicant, you want to say anything before we go to the council? Okay. Uh, let's kick it off. Uh, Matt, you want to start us off? I have no comments or concerns. Uh, Greg? No concerns. Chris? No concerns. We've been yeah. doing this for 14 years. Yeah, we've been doing it for 14 years. It's hard to believe. Uh, Don? No questions. Fred? No questions. Kelsey? No questions. Thank you. Dean? Nothing here, thanks. Don? Nothing for me. Okay, nothing from me other than, uh, as I said, it's been going on for a lot of years. Casey took it over a number of years ago. Great little establishment if you need your bedding plants, vegetables, things like that. So wonderful to see you back. Can't wait till you're doing uh, brick and mortar here. <laughs> Either way, if uh, there's anything from fire, didn't think so. Uh, with that, I'll ask for a motion on 8B. Oldani moves that the plan commission approves the temporary use permit request submitted by Cassie Ertle, CE Farms, for the operation of, garden, of a garden center in the parking lot on the property of 7501 South Howell Avenue with the following conditions. One, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Two, that all garden center activities shall be located within the portion of the parking lot as per the proposed map. Three, that operations shall occur between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday and between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Sunday. Four, the signing, that signage for the operation is limited to one 32-square-foot sign and one 12-foot square, si square foot sign. Each sign shall meet setback requirements, shall be placed so that the drive aisles and parking stalls remain unobstructed, and shall be stored within the tent area during non-business hours. Five, that a tent permit is obtained prior to operation. And six, that the temporary use permit shall be valid between April 15, 2024 through July 15, 2024. The property shall be restored to its pre-temporary use condition by no later than July 17, 2024. Who's the ghost girl second? Uh, roll call beginning with Matt. Sullivan Knight. Laura Guy. David Chai. Kuzikowski Aye. Old Ani Aye. Seifert Aye. Chandler Aye. Hannah Aye. Brillo Aye. Okay. Good luck. Hope to see you soon. Uh, item 8C consideration of a conditional use permit uh, request by Allie Arnett, Creative Productions Dance Studio. Uh, this is for a conditional use permit for an indoor health athletic recreation facility on the property, 7040 South 13th Street. Carrie? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a property in the B2 zoning district, and the request is for a dance studio in an existing multi-tenant commercial building. Uh, they do have shared access and parking to the facility. A couple more information items for you. Creative Productions is going to be the person operating or the business operating this dance studio. They are offering classes from ages two to adult. Classes are typically about 45 minutes to an hour and a half, and there are about 15 students that could be in the class each class, but that's the maximum. They are also anticipating about 15 employees that would be rotating through the classes, so it's not that there will be 15 employees on site at any one time, it's just that that's how many people would possibly be offering the classes. Uh, hours of operation from Monday through Friday, generally they're gonna be open between four and nine, that's when staff will be on site. Classes begin at 4.30 and will end by 8.30. Um, parking for the property, if we wanna talk about this a little bit. Um, we do have a plan, or there was a plan that was approved for the property itself in 1992. However, that plan is no longer available. It appears that the parking for the, par the parcel itself has been at 37 parking stalls since they were installed. The requirements for this particular type of use in the current code are one for every three patrons at peak hours. Um, that would be about 15 stalls if there were three classes going on at a time. Due to the fact that this is a multi-tenant building, we do have to look at the parking requirements for all tenants. We don't actually know what the other tenant or tenants would be. Um, not even sure if there's anybody in the building at the moment, but all the parking has to be shared for both of the uses or all of the uses. 
We don't anticipate, due to the fact that these are only nighttime classes, that there would be any perceived conflict between the uses, but that would be up to the landowner or the property man management company to ensure that there is sufficient parking for everybody. Little bit about the operation itself, there will be no drop-off lane. Anybody who's bringing a child for a class has to you know, physically walk them into and out of the building. So this isn't a situation where we're going to have people that are lined up along the building just waiting for their kids to come in and out. They have to, for security purposes, walk them in. So uh, just a reminder that the commission's initial review and recommendation of the proposed conditional use permit is not an endorsement of any site architectural landscaping or lighting plan that may be required as part of the final CUP. Any more detailed review of plans required by the conditional use permit will be conducted by staff in the plan commission subsequent to the issuance of the conditional use permit and accompanying conditions and restrictions. On the screen right now are actually the findings of fact that the plan commission must make a determination on in order to make a positive recommendation for the conditional use permit to the common council. So in this case, each one of these needs to have a, a positive finding in order for the conditional use conditional use permit to move forward. And if there are any questions with that, can certainly help out. Otherwise, there is a suggestion motion for consideration. Um, the findings would have to be made prior to that suggested motion. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, would the applicant like to say anything or just kind of wait on questions? Wait on questions? Okay. Uh, Chaucey, you want to start us out? Yes, I do have a question for the applicant. Hi, I'm Melanie Peterson at 2816 East Texas Avenue in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So since this facility, uh, it will have kids there. Yes. So what's the security measure for people coming in and out? The way the space is laid out, there is a reception desk at the main entry, and that's how we keep track of who's coming and going. Thank Current you. Yes. Oh, my apologies. Please no, that's continue. okay. That's how we currently operate as well. Okay. That's it? Yep, thank Brett? you. The only question I have is the parking. See the potential it could be down the road when you get everybody together. Do you have a solution? Well, I'd like to share that the parking that we have currently works just fine for us. It's actually less spaces than we have at this new facility, and we share with more tenants. So we are not concerned from an operation standpoint for the parking capacity at all. We hold all of our large events at, um, at schools, so we won't have anything large in this space. Thank you. Yes. John? No questions. Chris? Uh, what what type of activities would you guys be uh, doing for this space? Uh, you mentioned uh, you go to schools, but is it practice or, or mm -hmm. what is it? Okay. It's mostly practice, yes. There are some adult classes that are like a bar class or a yoga class, but it's mostly a children's game classes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, no concerns over parking, as I'm assuming most parents will pull into. As somebody who's had dancers that grew up at different <laughs> studios, I wish you luck on not having a drop-off area because that's bound to happen, I feel. Um, so good luck. I have no issues with this. Yeah. I have no comments. Don? No questions. Nothing here. Thank you. Um, none either. Uh, just out of curiosity, where are you coming from? Uh, we're coming from right off of um, Pennsylvania in 794 in Cudahy. Oh, okay. Well, welcome to Oak Creek. Thank you. We're excited. Uh, hopefully after this vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything from fire? Might be. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Mike Cavey, Assistant Chief Fire. Uh, so the submission that we received, we'll still have to do a further evaluation on the occupancy load and the factors of this is going to change the occupancy type of what the building was previously used for. So in that process, we have to evaluate that that use and the prevention measures of that building will match up and it's based on code. Okay. So there'll be a, a significant evaluation for what the needs will be for based on an occupant load. 
Will this hold up the applicant in any way, shape, or form from occupying? Or it may. It, and it, what's the possible. anticipated? So time? once we get with civil drawings, so then we can see what the life safety plan is, egress routes, and if a, a suppression system may be required based on the, the calculation load. Because this is a change from, an, from a business to an assembly, uh, which that's okay. really a, a code um, denomination of that value, that number would drive that. Uh, just out of curiosity, can you educate me at what capacity so, is a sprinkler system? So typically, if, if a business or an assembly, it's a, there's three categories of assemblies. So if this category of assembly would be considered a business, and this is under the International Law of Building Code, um, it may not require a suppression system. But it's based on that that number, which we have not seen yet because the, the civil plans haven't been, we haven't seen the architectural plans yet. So it's it's a it's a continual evaluation until we get those we can uh, match that up to code. Okay, I hope that makes I, sense. I, to to some extent. Yeah, it's it's fine. I just want to make sure that it's as smooth as possible for the applicant if if they started paying rent and gain. Yeah, well, I think on that permitting side of things, we'll discover um, based on what their plans will be. And like I said, we have to get the the architectural drawings with the occupant load to determine that. Understood. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, any questions for Assistant Chief Havey while he's up here? No, oh, very interesting. Did not know that. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay. There's no further discussion. Uh, we're looking for a motion on 8C. Mr. Mayor, prior to the oh. motion, we do need to have specific findings on these findings of fact. Oh, okay. Um, we will take them one at a time. Uh, and I'll just ask you to, to take the floor if there's objections. To it, uh, the establishment, establish, establishment, maintenance, or operation of the conditional use will not be detrimental or endangered to the public health, safety, or general welfare. I think that's all determined once fire does their calculation. Term there. Um, to the establishment of conditional use will not impede the normal and orderly development or improvement of the surrounding properties for the uses permitted in the district. Anybody? Uh, three adequate utilities, access roads, drainage, parking, supply, internal circulation improvements, including but not limited to uh, vehicular, pedestrian, bicycle, and other necessary site improvements have been or are being provided. Okay. And then four measures have been or will be taken to provide adequate egress and ingre, egre, ingress and egress uh, designed to maximize traffic congestion and to ensure public safety, adequate traffic site and the public street. Okay. And a conditional use conforms to all acceptable regulations of the district in which it is located. I think, think we're okay all in all, given my limited experience with places like this, and Greg mentioned, if they're operating in a tighter space, I think we'll be okay as long as they, they work it out with fire. Okay. Uh, the suggested most motion is on the screen if somebody would like to do it. Clark moves to recommend that the Common Council approve a conditional use permit for an indoor health athletic recreation facility on the property at 7040 South 13th Street after a public hearing and subject to conditions and restrictions that will be prepared for the Plan Commission's review at the next meeting, April 9th, 2024. Paper seconds. Uh, roll call. Beginning with Greg. Lorak, aye. David aye. Yusikowski, aye. Boldani, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler, aye. Kenna, aye. Sullivan night. Okay. Uh, good luck. Just stay in touch with fire. You'll get through. Uh, item 8D, uh, cons another consideration of a conditional use permit request by Rich Hansen, city switch to a uh, LLC for a conditional use for a telecommunication tower on the property, 1805 East College Avenue. Carrie? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a request for a telecom facility, which consists of a 90-foot, 95-foot tall monopole with a 5-foot tall lightning rod at the top in a 20 by 100 lease area on property that is currently owned by the railroad. It's also accessed by the property to the east, which is owned by We Energies, and therefore we have requested an access agreement. Um, there will be a proposed 12 foot wide gravel driveway to access the lease area, which is on the screen. That lease area will be fenced with a seven foot tall chain link fence, one foot of barbed wire on top. Uh, they also are proposing an easement, but it's actually easement on the railroad property as well. So we'll need copies of all those required or all of those agreements. Just make sure that we have everything on file. The pole equipment and future carrier leases are all intended to be within the leased area. There is an additional 20 by 25 gravel area outside to the south of the leased area. We've asked for a little bit more information about that, and that is forthcoming. This is an unmanned facility. No parking needs are um, in the code for providing parking stalls or anything like that. Um, we do have a requirement for the precondition impervious and the post condition or post development uh, impervious surface just to ensure that we are keeping that on file. On the screen right now is a bit of a close up of the of the lease area. This it does have a setback to the railroad uh, for the tracks and for their other equipment that's on there. So they do have a separate diagram that shows what those setbacks are. They are not ours. Um, a little bit of the an increased or an enlarged area on the right hand side. The purple box is actually showing where the generator is. Um, there's an ice bridge that connects it to the pole, which is in the green dot on the bottom. Just trying to highlight a little bit of where the equipment is. Everything is in the fenced area, which is highlighted in red. Also, there's uh, lease areas within the fenced area. On the screen right now, it just gives you an idea of what would be seen out there. The graphic on the left is actually the 12 foot wide gate that will be facing the street. However, again, this is a chain link fence that'll be around the entire compound. They did receive uh, an exemption letter from the airport. Um, they are in compliance with all FAA requirements. So uh, just a little bit of a, a disclaimer here. Due to the fact that this is a telecom facility, the city actually has very little in the way of authority for control over this type of development. Uh, we are restricted by uh, the state statute as well as FAA. So um, in terms of compliance with our local requirements, this pretty much meets all of the, the, pro the requirements that we've discussed so far. So the commission's initial review and recommendation of the proposed conditional use permit is not an endorsement of any site, architectural, landscaping, or lighting plan that may be required as part of the conditional use permit. More detailed review of any plans required by the permit will be conducted by staff and plan commission subsequent to the issuance of a conditional use permit and accompanying conditions and restrictions. Due to the location, we are not requesting any landscaping be installed as part of this development, as we had seen with a previous monopole in a different location in the city. So again, we have the findings of fact that must be made prior to the suggested motion that is on the screen currently. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, before we start off with the commission, uh, would the applicant like to say anything or just wait on questions if they want? Okay. Um, start. Jossie, you want to start us out? Surely. I, I have a question for Carrie. So for the chain link fence, does it have to have any opaque material to kind of cover that up? Or? It does not. It does this not. is okay. in an area of the city that does not require that there be any screening. Um, the zoning district doesn't require it. There's really, because of the type of use, we don't require that it have any kind of slats or any kind of, you know, special consideration for landscaping or anything like that. Um, the one requirement that we are going to suggest, um, because we typically require that all of the equipment be below the height of the fence, mm -hmm. they would be allowed to go up in height in order to compensate for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just a little concerned. Is that facility on the railroad property, their, their easement? Uh, Rod Carter. I 
I'm uh, representing the tower company in AT&T. We also have a representative from AT&T tonight. I'm with the law firm of Hush Blackwell in Milwaukee. It is located on railroad. Right away. Yes. Okay. So basically they are the owners of the property and you're leasing that from those people. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don? No questions. Chris? No questions. Greg? How, uh, that's kind of, that's the property outline that we have is very narrow and long. How close to College Avenue is it? You'll have to be on the microphone, sir. Glad you asked that question because that's an incorrect address that's on the slide. So we're actually locating um, at 1850 East College Avenue. And that's what the plans specify. And then I think the last slide with the, the motion language and the agenda also has the correct address. We'll verify it. Would that put you on the north side? Would that put you on the north side of college? Oh, yeah. My only concern was the airport. It's a high tower to be so close to the airport, but the they airport have, they approved it. Yeah, they've approved it. We knew to do that before coming to you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, I have no comments. Juan, nothing for me. Dan, um, actually, from looking at the very first page, I see that there are some. Uh, what happened to this? We're verifying the address. Just one moment. Okay. Uh, where the tower is um, uh, located or is going to be located is near a residential area. Have you checked at all if there is any concern with those residents with this monopole um, existing there or are there any concern with that? So m my understanding, pending staff's confirmation, Looking at my colleague in the back of the room is that we aren't near residential with the proposed location. Uh, good evening. My name is Andrew Flowers. I am the senior real estate and construction manager from AT&T. My address is 1000 Commerce Drive in Oak Brook, Illinois. So to answer your question, as we're going through the slides, it looks like there's two different addresses. Where we're at is 1805 um, College, which is I just was there so you got the um, mail facility that's right there and we're right to the west of that as it comes down that little hill right there we're right along the railroad track so there is no residential in that area it's all heavy commercial or commercial that's you know uh, another question I have is uh, safety so I don't know if you have any similar facilities uh, that um, the fence and the barbed wire is enough or sufficient to protect it from like kids jumping and trying to kind of play around with those equipment or yep that's, a, that's a very good question because we're, we're very concerned about safety so um, the barbed wire is enough to deter those that just kind of walk by and look at something um, the tower itself actually has no climbing pegs within the first 20 25 feet so you'd have to bring your own 25 foot ladder out there to even get on the tower and the equipment itself at the base is all locked cabinets. If the doors are opened up, they're automatically alarmed back to the switch, which then will send out a text slash, uh, it'll send the authorities out depending on what type of intrusion there's been at the site. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Okay. Oh, okay, Don? Um, so a little confused. We we got you're saying 1850. You're saying 1805. I think it, it, it's 1805. It's 1805. Yeah, it's 1805. Okay, and and that's what's uh, indicated on the map. That's correct. This is coming from Milwaukee County. Okay, thank you. So uh, where along this strip is the tower actually going to be located? So as you're standing on College Drive, you have the railroad tracks um, on your right hand side it is right along the railroad tracks right there um, there's actually a, a driveway that's already off of College Drive right there and a mm -hmm. turnaround we're we're proposing to go a little bit farther into that um, kind of grassy area and that's where it would be right along the railroad tracks uh, in land that's already owned by the railroad 
so uh, where uh, Carrie's showing right there. So pretty close to college. It's too large. That's it. There's a pad that's kind of, or a little building that's right here. It's south of that. Just south of that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but still, still way, way west side of that long strip, pretty much is. Yep. Okay. That that's kind of what I was side of the railroad for. tracks. And on the east yeah, side, it, I got, that's why it's twenty feet wide by a hundred feet. Uh, understood. East side, uh, in a little bit from College Avenue. There you go. Okay. That helps. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Uh, fire or anything? Fire is concerned. Uh, nothing from mine. Um, the FAA question popped in my head as well. Glad you got the letter. I'm really surprised. 100 feet. Uh, they really bust our chops here. We can't go over 60, and we're nowhere near the air well compared to this. So good for you. Um, without a doubt. I, other than that, I have really no questions that haven't been answered. So. Uh, yeah, I did too. You know, it's 100 foot with the lightning. Okay, uh, there's no further discussion. Uh, motion, please. Oh, we got to do facts. So uh, does everybody want me to reread this, or are you good looking at it in monitors? And if there's an objection, I'll take the floor. Just a quick question. Sorry, I know I missed the last couple of meetings, and this is something that's always been in our packet, correct? Because I've read it a million times. Uh, not, not, not to flush this out here, but are, is this something new we're going to be doing through every time th throwing it we up can on the have, screen? We can have a discussion item later to kind of explain this. This is in the code. This is something that is required for conditional use permits. Okay. Seifert moves that the Planning Commission recommends that the Common Council approves a conditional use permit to allow technical communications tower and associated equipment on the property at 1805 East College Avenue after a public hearing and subject to conditions and restrictions that will be prepared for the Planning Commission's review at the next meeting April 9th, 2024. Lorik seconds. Uh, before we do the roll call, just for the minutes, uh, fact the findings, there were no objections to them. Um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call, beginning with myself, aye. Wysikowski, aye. Huldani, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler, aye. Anna, aye. Brillo, aye. Sullivan, aye. Lorik, aye. All right, thank you, guys. Good night. Uh, item 8E, uh, this is a comprehensive plan amendment consideration uh, proposed to amend the comprehensive plan uh, by the City of Oak Creek, which was adopted March 3rd, 2020, last amended, uh, December 20th, 2022, and it would allow a change in the land use plan and category from single family attached to commercial for the properties at 800 and 812 West Oakwood Road. Carrie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we have two properties that are under application before the plan commission right now, and that's for a comprehensive plan amendment. So that's to change the land use category in the land use plan from what has been identified as single family attached for appropriate future development or redevelopment to commercial. A couple of reasons for this. One, it's identifying that the existing use of the property has been for quite some time a commercial enter enterprise. Um, the seller has actually come into acquisition of the property to the east, so that would be part of a future anticipated commercial building addition as well as an expansion of the parking lot onto that property. So bringing that additional property into the commercial land use category would also be uh, part of this request. Again, if approved, this is not an endorsement of any future concept plan or and future reviews up to in, including site plan, but review will be required. Um, just as a point of uh, order, approval requires a majority approval of the entire plan commission. So since we have a full plan commission tonight, we do need a majority to move this forward to the Common Council. So just a bit of a of background. So this is what the current comprehensive plan identifies the 
subject parcels and the surrounding par parcels as being appropriate for future development. The orange is identifying single family attached, so kind of your side-by-sides, your duplexes, your single family intended developments that are not in a single family detached or your traditional single family um, arrangement. The light yellow are all of the areas that have been identified as single family detached. Uh, some of those, or the majority, are actually currently developed with single family detached, your traditional single family homes. There's also floodway in the, in the area. That is not being proposed to change at all. That would remain. Uh, the light purple is showing industrial. The pink is showing your utility and railroad, so that's already there. That's not going to change. The blue that is in these kind of these far right corner on the south end of this area that I have highlighted here, that's identifying the business park. That's actually Oakview Business Park. And then finally to the north, the green area is identifying a future park, park and open space. This is what the comprehensive plan calls for currently. The existing uses in the area, immediately to the west is um, the English Air and the amendment and the additions to English Air subdivision, so that's single family. To the south and southwest, we have Oakwood Terrace, another subdivision, and a mix of residential and commercial. Immediately across Oakwood Road, we have a couple of properties that have kind of this mixed residential and commercial uh, use that has been established over the years as well. To the north, again, I've mentioned that we have land that's reserved for future public space, parks and open space. Um, the floodway is not being proposed to change at all. To the west, the manufacturing that's been identified are FedEx, air products, and a you know, we have Oakview Business Park as the business park identified category. There are two options before the plan commission. One is to limit the comprehensive plan amendment to the two par uh, parcels that were included in the application. So that would be 800 and 812 West Oakwood Road. That's what was requested by the applicant. That would change from single family attached to commercial. So that would recognize the existing use of the seller as a restaurant, commercial use, and then allow for every part of the property outside of the floodway area to also be recognized for future commercial use. There would be additional requirements for reviews, including certified survey map to combine the properties, uh, rezoning the larger property, the property at 800, um, site and building plan review, et cetera. So that would come after this process. Option two is being presented by staff for consideration because there were only three properties that were identified as being possible contenders for future single family attached development or redevelopment. If we do not include that parcel, which is 910, then we would leave one parcel that would be subject to single family attached future redevelopment that just didn't seem to make any sense to staff. So we are recognizing that it is currently developed with a single family detached residence and due to the extensive floodplain and floodway on the property, it's not likely to change over to anything but single family residential. If the plan commission agrees, then that would become single family detached and it would blend in with the existing subdivision that is identified to the west. It would only be commercial for the two requested properties for the seller. If there are any questions about that, I can certainly try and clarify. Um, but this is just kind of recognizing what the properties in the area have historically been used for and then presenting them for the future consideration. So on the, on the screen right now, we have option one, which is just limiting it to what the applicant requested. Option two includes that staff recommendation. Per Wisconsin Statute 6223 sub 3b, adoption of any amendment must be made by a majority approval of the entire plan commission. The state of Wisconsin smart growth law requires that all local land use decisions after January 1st, 2010 must be consistent with the objectives, goals, and policies contained within the comprehensive plan, hence the request before the plan commission tonight. So if there are any questions, be happy to try and answer them. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, before we start out, applicant, want to say anything? Okay. Uh, 
Yes, we'll. Uh, yeah, come on up, sir. We'll need your name and address. Uh, hang on. Uh, My name is Richard Grams, 980 West Canterbury Court. My property abuts this. Richard, you got to stand on microphone. So the question is, where are they going to get in to address that little piece they want to keep residential? So that is already currently developed with a single family residential home. Okay. So this is just changing the comprehensive this is plan. Zoning. It's not changing zoning. It's only changing what that parcel could be used for in the future, but it's not changing the existing use. And it's not changing the existing uh, zoning. The comprehensive plan is kind of like our master plan, identifying areas in the city of where we think certain development, certain types of development should occur. This was considered a transition area, and we thought at the time that the comprehensive plan was adopted that that parcel, in addition to these two other parcels, might be appropriate for single family attached or duplexes, side by sides, those kinds of developments, if they were to redevelop in the future. Based on what we've seen, this that type of category doesn't seem to make any sense for these three parcels. So the one that's uh, at 910, we're recommending that it just stay single family detached, single family residential. So it is now and we're leaving it. Correct. Okay, I didn't understand that. Not a problem. Because there's a, there's a detention pond right next to me and I could, I, there is some land in there that uh, the city owns, right? I believe so, but that's not actually that's part not of, part that's of not part of this, no. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, we'll go to Commission Jossie. A quick question, Carrie. So, the part that's identified as single family detached, there are properties there today or could be? There, it's currently developed with a single family residence. Okay. And so, if any. Um, businesses or specific items for the commercial category comes into that area, they would have to have certain buffers, et cetera, since it's budding against residential areas? So the reason that staff is recommending that it be changed from single family attached to single family detached is due mostly to the extensive floodway that's been identified on the property. We don't see there's any real... Um, compliant way to change the use of the property in the future. If it were to be a single family attached situation, they would have to build up. They couldn't build out from where it currently, where the house currently sits and still meet all the other code compliance requirements. So it just makes sense that if this is going to remain as a single family residential parcel, it should remain single family detached. There really isn't a development opportunity that we can find, at least right now, that would allow them to go to a single family attached situation. Similarly, because of the extensive floodway on the property, we don't see a, a real feasible way to move forward with the commercial use on the property either. It's not to say that they couldn't request that in the future should they have that plan come up, but right now there doesn't seem to be a, a feasible way to do that. Thank you. Brad? No questions. Don? No questions. And if we're uh, debating as a commission on the options, which we have to pick one, uh, option two, as uh, proposed by staff, makes easily makes the most sense, in my opinion. Chris? I'll lie. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Don. Option uh, two. Greg? Um, <clears throat> did I hear correctly that the backwards P portion is seller property now? Correct. I guess a question for the applicant. Um, sounded like that you were looking at expanding the parking lot. Is that property currently where it's kind of grass and gravel that everybody parks anyways? Yeah, my name is William Nelson, 811 East Elm Road. <clears throat> Um, yeah, it serves gravel there, and I didn't own the property. I bought it, uh, we purchased it last year, and um, a friend of mine owned it, so he let us use it for parking, and then in the spring it got real muddy, so we just put gravel down to keep it. People was just parking on the grass. 
though now we want to pave it and okay. expand our parking. Is there any plans that you, I guess you have for the, the back portion of that property? Not right now. Okay. No, I'm just we just purchased. Like I said, I wanted to originally just purchase the acre that we we want to use, but the the seller said I had to buy the whole thing, okay. and I have no plans for the back at this point in time. But yeah, that, who knows? You know, down the road. Sure. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, I would support option two. Matthew? I agree with commission. I support option two, and I also want to thank uh, staff for being able to provide these two options. What? Nothing from me. <laughs> Nothing here. Thank you. Um, I have no further questions either. Uh, out of courtesy, buyer? Opinion? Okay. Um, no further discussion. A motion. I just have one point of oh. clarification. These motions don't actually specify that the land use category would change outside of the floodway areas. So just keep that in mind. Um, in fact, I can change it right now just to make sure that it's reflected accurately. Stand by. parking yeah we're pretty busy yeah I know always uh, be doing well when I pay a visit yeah yeah it's been good ever since uh, it's in COVID just everything changed we put that pavilion outside yeah and it's Beautiful just a real back. popular place everybody wants to be outside so yeah it's working out well unfortunately we still have like, the original kitchen and it's literally really difficult to serve on Friday and Saturday nights you know we have four cooks back there we're so busy and so this is all part of it we want to expand our kitchen a little bit as well we don't have any storage because the cellar is the basement the bar area so we don't have any storage we and we're just really we're outgrowing the building yeah problem but it's a good problem yeah it's been awesome this will be our 25th year oh that congr I've been there. congratulations yeah, October 1st yeah Okay, um, we do have a recommended suggested motion. Uh, somebody'd like to go. Clerk moves to adopt resolution 2024-01, amending the land use plan category in the comprehensive plan, City of Oak Creek, adopted March 3rd, 2020, last amended December 20th, 2022. From single family attached to commercial, no change to the floodway category for the properties at 800 and 812 West Oakwood Road, and from single family attached to single family detached, no change to the floodway category for the property at 910 West Oakwood Road, following review and adoption by the Common Council. Kruzikowski, I'll second. Uh, roll call, beginning with you, Chris. Kruzikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Seaford, aye. Chandler, aye. Hannah, aye. Rulo, aye. Sullivan Knight. Laura Guy. Okay, we try. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Um, that'll bring us to adjournment uh, in an hour. So, motion to adjourn. Gorilla moves to adjourn at 6.58. See for seconds. Uh, roll call beginning with Don. Hold on, I. See for I. Chandler I. Hannah I. Gorilla I. Laura Guy. David Chai. Here's a Kowski. All right. Good night.